Now, welcome to church, everybody. Welcome to church. Next Sunday, starting a series to really help you. We started this year off saying, uh, with a question, what's your plan for that? You want to grow spiritually? Well, what's your plan for that? And really the way that we will grow, the version of us now and where we want to be, the biggest way that we can close that gap is with our habits. With our habits. So the next series that we are starting is really to help us develop habits that will support us to become the person that God has destined us to be. And part of following Jesus means that we get to share our faith. And so to help, just put a little tool in your hand. You have an invite card in your seat. If you would just invite one person every week, I believe that you will grow in your own walk with Jesus. As you share your own faith, as you invite other people in. Because one thing, it'll help somebody else. It'll help them in their walk with Jesus, but also it's helping you get comfortable sharing your faith and inviting people to church. And it could just be the very thing that changes their life forever. They could be looking for a relationship with God. They could be looking for community. Like, who is that person that you could personally invite? So take these cards, put them in your wallet, put them in your purse, put them in your pocket, and just be looking for opportunities where you can invite somebody with you to this next series. Sound good? All right, well, again, if this is your first time here, you are joining us on our eighth day of 21 days of prayer and fasting. How y'all doing out there? Y'all hungry? You're like, Jesus, you are the bread of life. Bread is life. I get it. But this 21 days of prayer and fasting isn't really about like a checklist of, yes, I'm going to eat this. No, I can't eat that. You're drinking coffee. You're probably going to go to hell. Like we're not, it's not about that. It's not about that. It's about how can we consecrate ourselves to the Lord in the first part of the year? How can we begin the year consecrating ourselves to God? Because there's a principle of the first. God gets my first every day. God gets my first of the week. God gets the first of my paycheck. He gets it in a tithe. And then we have been in the the, um, habit, in the routine of giving God our first in 21 days of prayer and fasting every January. So it's about consecrating ourselves. It's about seeking Jesus. It's about finding him when when we seek him with all of our heart. So I hope that you are um, just realizing new things about God. I hope that he is continuing to reveal himself to you in this season. And to help resource you and walk you through this, we have a couple of things. One is the pursuit book at the back. And many of you have grabbed one. And it's really hard as a church to gauge participation in something like prayer. You just don't know, like who's praying, who's not praying. But we do know by those of you who have joined the group online um, through the Church Center app, this is the most engagement we've ever been able to track as a church. And I just think, hey, guys, what could God do with a church who is seeking him? What could God do through a church who is pursuing him and consecrating themselves to him? I just think the sky is the limit and God is going to do miraculous things through you individually and through us as a church. And the other resource... It's the book, so download the app, join the group. Side note, turn your notifications off. This is a beautiful place of community on it. And so people are sharing their answers to a discussion question. They're saying good morning. It's a beautiful place of community. We invite you into it. And if you're like, oh, there are you a weekend. I'll just probably catch it next year. Let me tell you guys, you got 14 more days. 14, that's a lot. If you want to slow down time, I have two tips for you. Number one is do planks. And the other one is to fast. You're like, eight? Like, time flies, except when you are fasting. You're like, man, this is going great, and I'm on day four? You're like, that can't be right. I'm going to check to get you on day four. So you still have 14 days to join us. It's not too late. So download the app, join the group, pick up a book at the back. I personally am loving this book. So this is a two-week series on prayer. He started it. I'm going to end it. It's like, too, but it's prayer. Like we could talk for weeks and weeks and teach and get into the theology and share stories. And we could talk a lot about prayer. And what's great about this resource is that it's basically 21 really helpful uh, biblical lessons on prayer. It's like this really neat combination between like practical and spiritual at the same time. And you guys are so sweet. Last week I was out on the patio greeting y'all and many of you were like, thank y'all so much for this book. I can't believe y'all are giving us this book. Like, thank you. And really, I just want to thank you for your faithfulness to obey God's word by tithing and, and your generosity 
Because when you obey God in that way, then we get the joy and the honor and the responsibility of stewarding those resources that God has given us. And it allows us to be able to steward that in a way that we can help resource you to grow into all that God has for you. So I just want to thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity that allows us to, to help uh, just resource you guys. Can we thank, can we thank our, our generous... The generosity and faithfulness of you guys, y'all are amazing, and we're very, very grateful for one of the most generous churches I have ever known in my whole life. So, fasting. Fasting is a fun time because we just learn things that we can only learn through fasting. The discussion question on the um, app yesterday was, what is fasting showing you about you? I had already been collecting a list for today. But I wanted to know what y'all's were because I have a, a feeling that we probably, like it's probably the same. We're probably experiencing a lot of the same things. And there could be a long list, but I only have 10 for you today. So I have a list for you of fast, things that fasting has shown me about me. Number one is that it's challenging me so I know that it's changing me. Anybody challenged? All right, y'all. Just, you know, you thank God for the challenge. Thank you, Lord, for this challenge. I know that it's changing me. Thank him for the challenge. Number two, it's that I give in easily to my flesh. Fasting is strengthening the spirit person over my flesh. Paul talks about it. He goes, I don't do the things that I want to do, and I do the things that I don't want to do. I might have said that twice, but you get the point. Like Paul's like, there's stuff I want to do, and I'm not doing those things. There's this, there's, there are these opposing forces within us. It's the spirit versus the flesh. And the call to Christ is to crucify the flesh. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. And fasting shows me just how much my flesh is often calling the shots over the spirit person in me. Number three, I am too driven by appetite and delight. Always looking for that little something sweet after dinner, you know? Always looking for it's going to be fun, easy, delightful in food and otherwise. Just like, hey, this, this is hard. Let's go, let's go ride go-karts or something. Number four, my tolerance threshold for not getting what I want is low. (laughs) Do you remember the commercial that the lady's hanging out the window? Like, we probably all thought that it was like satire from the commercial, but they meant it as like a legit commercial. She's out the window. She's like, I want it, and I want it now. And we're like, you're awful. Also, she lives inside of all of us. She, she is us. Like, there is, there, inside of all of us, there is this screaming toddler that's like, I want it, and I want it now. And that's that flesh person, right? That's that flesh in us. And the call to Christ is to crucify the flesh. Every day it's a let's lay down our life and follow Jesus. And, and a lot of times the, the more we can get used to not getting our way, the better servant we will be to those around us. So I'm, I'm grateful that it's really only through fasting that I can increase my tolerance of not getting what I want. If you want to also grow your tolerance not getting what you want, start choosing the longest line at the grocery store. Choose the slow lane when you're driving. <laughs> Nobody drives the way you want them to drive, am I right? Number five, being hungry for God makes me think about God a lot more. Do you see what I did there? Number six, resisting temptation is a constant battle. What I focus my thoughts about this really matters. And what I have noticed is that where my eyes go, my, my feet will follow, then my heart is just like we're all there together. But it starts, it starts with my eyes. My mind is probably the second thing. Like I look at it and then I'm thinking about it. And then I get, want to give myself to it. You can see the, the sin, the life, the, the implications there. We were at Chipotle with some of y'all Friday night getting that sofritas. And as we were in line to get fake food, I meant sofritas. <laughs> they, brought out, they brought out the fresh bin of fajita meat. It was like grizzled. It was cooked nice. And I looked away. I was like, no, because I know where my eyes go, my mind's going to follow. And where my thoughts go, then I'm going to give myself to it. He, he goes, oh, they just, I would, don't look, don't look, just look away, look away, look away. So our, our thoughts, our eyes matters in that. Number seven, my emotions and appetite are directly connected. 
I find that I seek pleasure in food when something is emotionally difficult. My aim is to develop a discipline of going to God with hard feelings rather than masking them or distracting me from them with the dopamine, the pleasure chemical in our brain, from delicious food. That's just for me. This is what God has shown me about me. Maybe he is showing you that as well. Something is difficult. I'm like, I'm just going to go to Garcia's. Like, I just need a plate of, like, enchiladas with some, like, that sauce on it, you know, and some, you know, like, let's just go. Let's go get some Mexican food <laughs> or a milkshake or dessert. So for me, I'm, like, looking for Mexican food or sweets. But really what God has shown me is that I am all that you need. I'm the honey in the rock. What you need, it's me. So my aim in this fasting is that I want to pause when things are difficult and, I, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm becoming more aware of my tendency to go to those things. Like, let's have, let's have good feelings. Let's engage those, those good chemicals in our brain because this is actually difficult. Actually, God wants to walk with me through those difficult things. So my aim is to go to him with it. Number eight, discipline isn't limiting. It's freeing. When the most important things are prioritized, it's freeing to cut the fat and focus on the necessary. If I don't have time to spend with God, I am too busy. I can't remember who said it, but there's a quote that says, when, when we're overscheduled, we are wreaking violence on our souls. And I just think that there's this call to a slow down spirituality. And if I prioritize God first thing in the morning, it really shows where I'm fitting things into my life and into my schedule that don't need to be there. So there's a call for me to cut the fat. Number nine, rituals aren't boring or meaningless. They are special and give meaning to life and create anticipation for what's to come. So the the ritual or the routine, the discipline, the habit of meeting with God every day isn't boring. I I look forward to it. I I don't find it boring like I just did this yesterday. Like, no, I look forward to it. I look forward to coming to church. We, We go out on Friday nights. We get a babysitter. Friday night's our date night. I never find it boring. I look forward to it. In fact, this week on Wednesday, I was like, oh, it's Wednesday. That means tomorrow's Thursday. That means it's date night eve. I look forward to it. There's a time of connecting. It's a time for us to have conversation. It's a time for us to have fun together. It's a time for us to shut out all the other voices and we're just together. Even if it's been a hard week, I find that I still look forward to it because I know that we're going to have those moments to like, of reconciliation or of honesty, of, of tenderness. Like We know that that moment is coming. And we look forward to it. So, so I just want to encourage you in this to not see the daily thing as, as mundane or boring, but let it be an anticipation where you're like, I know that I'm meeting with God tomorrow morning, and I'm, really, like, I'm going to talk to him about some things. I know my appointment's coming. I was really challenged when Pastor Lena last week said, we've got to keep our appointments with God. I don't cancel other appointments. I keep those. So I want to keep my appointment with God and look forward to it. Number 10. I'm definitely a southern style cook. It's challenging for me. I need something I can bread, fry, and cook some gravy with it. It's the kind of food my grandma said sticks to your ribs, you know. This is new for me. I just found out the official word for baby corn. I was buying stuff. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do an online order because I don't even know what coconut aminos are. I don't even know. I don't know how. I bought red cabbage for the first time in my life. It's exciting. Exciting times. Learn how to cook some new ways, you know. And fun conversations at the house, he's like, oh, I put the papaya on the air fryer because the boys were using it as a football. I'm like, cool. I didn't buy the dragon fruit for the smoothie because it was like $6, so we're going to have to use a mango instead. So we're just learning all kinds of stuff. I hope that God is continuing to show you things about you as well as you're fasting. And these are things that really only fasting can show you. You know, like only fasting can do these kinds of things for you. And so it's important for us as Christians to develop these disciplines of prayer and fasting. So look, if if you haven't joined us, you've got 14 whole days to hunger for the Lord. A two-week series on prayer. It's a little bit challenging, but I'm going to do my best. And what we can't get to today, we'll try to put a devotional, maybe just even a video devotional together for you over the next couple weeks. But last week, Pastor Lane said that prayer is communication. It's both listening and speaking. So there's a listening to God. 
There's a seeking him, we're speaking to him, and we're listening. It's this conversation, this communication, because our goal is to create and to cultivate a lifestyle of prayer that enables us to hear from God. Because there's a difference in being a believer and being a follower of Jesus. A, a believer versus disciple are different. And, and honestly, it's, it's one thing to be a believer. Maybe that's nice. I don't know how nice it is when even the Bible says, well, you know what? The demons, they believe. So I don't know how nice it actually is. What's nice is like when we, when we believe God and we trust him and we hear from him and we do what he says. That's what being a disciple is, is that we hear from God and we do what he says. And so our, our prayer life is, is communicating with God and it's hearing from him and it's doing what he says. So I have a question for you today and one that I will try to help answer us by the time we end our time together today. A question for you is, who taught you how to pray? If you were just to kind of think and reflect on your own spiritual journey, who taught you how to pray? Maybe there was a small group leader. Maybe there was a friend. Maybe just being in the room with people. But I think the reality for a lot of us is that nobody really taught us how to pray. That discipleship factor has kind of been missing where we haven't really been taught how to pray. And so really all I can do is share with you the things that I do when I pray. And that's what I'm going to seek to do today is just help resource you. Um, because I think that we know we need to pray. And a lot of times we want to pray. And then we find ourselves, you may even do the thing like, I'm going to go to bed early, off to a great start. I'm going to get up early, great start. You show up with the Lord, and then it's like, well, this is a little awkward. I'm going to be honest. Like, I'm not sure what to say. I'm not sure, like, I'm going to try my best. I'm not sure what words to use. So I just want to help um, teach you today what some of these things are that you can do in your prayer time to God. That way, when you wake up tomorrow morning, you know where, you, you know where you're going in prayer that you have some practical tools to use in your prayer time. And I want to just acknowledge and celebrate the fact that many of you are praying your own prayers to God for the very first time in your whole life. And I don't think that's a small thing. We're learning a new way of doing things. It changes the way our thought patterns go. And to pray for the very first time, that's amazing. So we just want to come alongside you today and help, help you right where you are. And to do that, our foundation for prayer is knowing who we are praying to. The fact that we are praying to a loving Father. When we pray, we are in communication with a loving Father. He is not a harsh taskmaster. He's not an angry king. He's not a heartless tyrant. He is a loving Father. Statistically, many of us struggle with what that metaphor means because we did not grow up with the privilege of having a godly, loving father. I myself fit into that category. I love my dad. I'm grateful for the things that my dad taught me. But I didn't learn to pray from him, and we don't have that loving kind of relationship. He was not a man who followed God and did what he said and taught me how to do that. I didn't see that example of a loving father in the day in and day out, really, until I met Landon's dad. And sometimes our dads love us in the best way that they know how, and I believe that was probably the case for my dad. I know that like my dad worked hard, and he provided for us. Those are all loving things. But as far as like really understanding the fullness of the scope of it, I really saw it when I met Landon's dad. And then after we got married, I got to become his daughter too. And I just have been so blessed by seeing it lived out. Dad, you, got it. you have an amazing opportunity in front of you to model for your children what a loving father looks like. And then I've seen it grow in Landon as a parent as well, the way that he loves our children and sometimes I'm like, I wonder what it would have been like to have been raised by a dad like that. Like, it, like to, he, Landon knows our kids' friends' names. Landon knows the names of the kids who sit next to our daughter on the bus. Like, he knows them. He loves them. He cares for them. One of our kiddos got pushed down by another kiddo. A female child got pushed down by a male child, just so you can feel the feelings of it. And this child was telling me the story, and I was like, well, you can tell your dad about that one. <laughs> and as she was telling the story, I could see his face, like, changing, like a loving father. Don't mess with her. A loving father. I want to share Luke eleven nine with you. 
It says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your, will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He's a loving Father. God is love. God is love. Galatians 4, 6 and 7 says, Because you are sons and daughters, because we are God's kids, we are his children. He says, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. God is love. God is the source of love. All love comes from God. Over 800 times in the Bible, it says that God is love. And because, God ulti- because love ultimately comes from God, when God extends his love to us, even through the, the, the sacrifice of his son Jesus, like a loving father who loves us so much, And we were separated far from him, but because he loves us, he made a way for us to get to him through his son, Jesus. Because God is holy and we are not. God is in heaven and we are on earth. He is creator. We are created and we were far from him. But in his love to get us to him, he gave us his son, Jesus. A loving father made a way for us to get to him. And because we're invited into this loving relationship with him, prayer is how we communicate within this loving relationship. So as we're talking about prayer, we need to know that we're invited into this loving relationship. And prayer is how we communicate. And in Luke 11, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And I want to let you know that the disciples were not the Bible scholars of the time. They were not like the temple teachers of God's word. They were fishermen. They were, they were blue-collar jobs. One was a tax collector. They were a variety of everyday kind of jobs. And so they're, they're with Jesus, and they're wanting to learn how to pray. And they say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he said, when you, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. And this is the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. And this would have been one of the first times where publicly God is referred to as Father, which shifted everything. Whereas before, maybe God was distant, God was far away, and now we can perceive him and relate to him and communicate with him as a loving father. Jesus refers to God as father 165 times recorded in scripture. It was his favorite title for God. And so I just want to challenge you when you are praying, know that he is not mad at you. He loves you. There's a story of the prodigal son and the father representing God where he is there with arms wide open. He throws a party for the son that's been gone. He's not mad at the son. He doesn't chastise the son. He doesn't punish the son. He welcomes the son home because his son has come home. So when the disciples ask Jesus to teach them how to pray, Jesus responds with the rest of what is known as the Lord's Prayer. Let's read it together. It says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many of us grew up saying that prayer with somebody. So it's weird to say it alone, right? I felt y'all joining me. Could hear y'all a little bit. We used to say this with my soccer team before a game. We'd always recite this prayer. Honestly, like when I'm saying it alone, I'm like, let's say it together. Because that's how it's always said is like in a group. We have some friends who every night they pray the Lord's Prayer with their kids. But this was Jesus' example when his disciples asked him how to pray. So if you ever come to a moment of prayer and you're like, so God, do you mean? You and me, me and you, you and me. This is how you should pray. And I just want to let you off the hook if you struggle with it. There are four sentences in the Lord's Prayer. Some of you are about to fact check me. I'm just letting you know. I counted. Four sentences. (laughs) Looking for a way to prove it wrong. There are four four sentences in the Lord's Prayer. I mean, there's a a creative use of commas and semicolons and that kind of thing. So you you get more bang for your buck. But still, at the end of the day... Avoided those run-on sentences, teachers, am I right? 
it just wasn't a long answer. He didn't give us like three pages of prayers that we're expected to pray. Like it's a, it's a, relational, it's a relational communication with God. So I just want to share with you a couple of tools in which have helped me personally in my prayer life. And the first one I will call prayer maps. And this reminds me of when we're at the mall. It's still a thing sometimes. There are certain stores only in the mall. When you're at the mall and you're looking for the next place that you're going to go, the first thing you have to find on this map is what? Yeah, the you are here thing, right? That's the first thing you have to identify. You have to know where you are. And the second thing you need to identify on the map is where you are going. The third thing you do when you're looking at a map is you have to identify how you're going to get where you're going to go. I'm going to go here. I'm going to turn here. And I'm going to go straight towards Macy's. you got to know where you're going in the, in the mall. And so a prayer map for me helps me know, all right, this is where I am in my prayer and this is where I'm going next. Just really simple. And, the, and it's so simple, I don't mean to offend you. Honestly, it has helped me get my prayer legs under me. Like if you've ever had to get your sea legs under you, you sometimes have to develop prayer legs as well. It just helped me find my own voice and rhythm within prayer. And so I want you to see the first one. It's an acronym for the word ACTS. And it's just a, an acronym that I follow and I go down. So when I kind of maybe get lost in my words or I'm not sure what to pray next, I just think through what letter did I just pray about and where am I going next? So the first one is admiration, where you're just lavishing love on the Father. You're praising him for who he is, for his sovereignty, for his goodness, for his holiness. And you can spend a moment admiring the goodness of God. And when we see the Lord's Prayer where he says, hallowed be your name, that's essentially what that is. God, you are holy. God, you are good. So you're beginning your prayer time with admiration to the Father. And the next one is C. It's confession. Where it's this acknowledgement of, God, you are holy and I am not. Let me tell you a little bit about that. <laughs> like, you can spend some time confessing your own stuff to the Lord. You don't have to go to a priest. It doesn't have to be in a box. Uh, you, on your own, can confess your sins to God. And you can even just confess, God, I, I have bombed it a couple times this week. I'm, I have messed up. God, I was prideful. I was selfish. Lord, would you forgive me for my sin? There can be a moment of asking God for his forgiveness over your life. And if this seems overly simple for you, I just want to let you know it has actually helped me a lot. So I, I love on God. I'm like, okay, what's next? Confession. And I do that. I'm like, what's next? A, C, T. All right, T, thankfulness. God, thank you. Thank you that I'm healthy. Thank you we have vehicles. Thank you we have a home. Thank you my kids are well. And I think that when we can approach God with thankfulness, it helps to lift our eyes. Do you remember earlier we talked about where our eyes go, our brain follows? If my eyes can be lifted as to the goodness of God, my brain follows and I see that a lot more than the list of things I wish were different. Because I have some, I bring some gratitude to the table. And when it comes to teaching our children how to pray, this is a place that we started. We started gratitude journals for the kids. I'll admit, I started it for selfish reasons because they were working my nerves, asking me to buy stuff all the time. And I'm just like, I'm not buying you stuff all the time. You got stuff. Be grateful for the stuff you have. I was like, you know what? We're going to do some prayer journals. You need, to, you need to see what you have so you can be grateful for what you got. And in spite of the fact I may not have started these journals for the right reasons, the Lord and his goodness, there's still fruit from it. And what we have discovered is that it's good for all of us. And it's, a, it's an easy way to teach kids about prayer is thankfulness to God for the blessings that they have. Because none of us are entitled to any of it. God don't owe us anything. He don't owe us any of it. Anything I have that's a blessing is out of his kindness and his goodness to me. Not because I'm good or earned it or deserved it. Because what I earn and deserve is hell. That's what I deserve. But God in his kindness and his goodness gave me Jesus. And if we can begin with gratitude, it changes our disposition. And I think a lot of us, the, the depression that we feel, the heaviness, would begin to lift some if we did this every day. If we did it every day, make it a daily practice. It's an important part of prayer. And then I think, well, God, I thank you for all these things. What am I supposed to say next? Supplication, which we needed a word to go with S because Acts. Supplication means prayer requests. 
You're bringing your request to the Lord. It is his hand that heals. He is the one who provides. He is the one that opens the door that no man can open. These are the times that you bring these requests to God. You need a breakthrough. You need provision. You need healing in a relationship. You bring these requests to God. And so these are the really, those last two are the things that we teach our children. Thankfulness and supplication. Also for fun and my own amusement, if, you know, bedtime can sometimes be a, a, a grind that we love. But confession, like in the, in the prayer time with kids, I'll be like, you know, what do you want to thank God for? Also, any confessions of your sins that you would like to say tonight? <laughs> hey, I started it for fun and I'm just never um, bored by their answers in that one. <laughs> so admiration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, prayer requests to the Lord. And the next one, the next thing that I like to do when I pray are personal declarations. And these are good to do when I'm out on a prayer walk. If you're a walker when you want to pray, these are, this is just a good tool to have. And these are personal declarations where I will just use my body as a, the map for it. So I'll go out on a walk and I will start at the top and I will just work my way through. Lord, would my mind be set on things above? God, would my mind be set on the things of Christ? Lord, the thoughts that are not from you, would you give me the wisdom, the, the insight, and the uh, courage to take those thoughts captive? Would I trust you with those thoughts? God, would, would I think about the things that you have for me? God, would I think about, and I just, I, I pray over my mind. And then my eyes. God, would I, would I see you in today? Would I see you in the faces of the people I'm encountering today? God, would I, would I look upon things? that are holy and righteous and true and honor you. God, would, I, would you focus my eyes today on what is most important? God, would you focus my eyes? And then my ears, God, God, would I listen for ways that I can honor you? God, would I be listening for opportunities to share my faith with somebody else? God, would I listen to the people as they talk to me and really listen to what they're saying and not how I can respond? God, would you, would you help my ears today? And, and then you can make it a, a declaration. God, I declare, you can speak over yourself. God, I declare that today I am hearing the word of God, that I, that I hear people for what they are saying. You can make it a declaration. And then my mouth, God, would you use my mouth today? God, I declare that my mouth is a tool of the Holy Spirit today, that I will speak truth to people, that I will speak kindness, that I will speak encouragement, that I speak when you tell me to, not when my flesh wants to. God, would my mouth be used for you today to build people up, not to tear people down? God, would you give me the words for today? And then I'll work in my way down. Lord, would my heart be focused on you? God, would my heart be turned towards you today? God, would you break my heart for what breaks your heart? And now that you have fasted, you understand how you can pray over your stomach. Lord, would I hunger for you? God, would my appetite be for you? God, would I... You can just pray over your stomach. Lord, would you be the one that satisfies? God, my hands, my hands were skilled for what you have for me today. Would I rest in confidence that I could do all that you have before me? Would my hands be an extension of your love and kindness and mercy to those around me? Would I be gentle with people? Would I be diligent in what I'm doing? Would I not waste my time doing silly things, but would these hands be put to, to good use for you today? And then I would pray over my feet. God, my feet, would they take me into the places that you have for me today? God, would you anoint my feet? That I go into the room, when I enter a room, that I know the Holy Spirit's with me, that he's going before me. Would I go in places, and would I be a blessing to those where I'm going? And honestly, I'm just kind of modeling how I would pray through that. And if I do that for a while on a walk, and then I can spend some time listening, I think that is a pretty healthy prayer that you're bringing to God. You're surrendering yourself to him. And you can just take your whole body. God, I surrender all of me to you. God, I belong to you. I'm going to lay my life down at the altar. I will pick up my cross and follow you. You're just declaring those things over yourself. And then the third one is to pray scripture. We see that Jesus prayed scripture. He often quoted scripture. Many of the Psalms are quoting scripture. And if you need some good scriptures to quote, you could do a quick Google search. Scriptures to pray. And then the little thing will help you out. And it'll say, when I feel. <laughs> scriptures to pray, whatever. And when you pray scripture, you agree, declare, and ask. You agree with scripture. An important part of praying scripture is that you are agreeing with God's will for your life. 
because scripture aligns with God's will. And when we pray scripture, we are praying God's will over our life because God will not bless that which is outside of his will. And we see that modeled even even in the Lord's prayer. God will not bless our sin, our disobedience, or our rebellion. God will not bless those things. God will bless the things that are in alignment with his will. So when we pray scripture, we are praying God's will over our lives. Some of my favorite scriptures to pray, like you could go through the Lord's Prayer and just take each of those sentences. Lord, your will be done, not mine. That's a whole prayer right there. (laughs) That's a whole prayer. Lord, your will be done, not mine. Lord, let us forgive our debtors. Lord, help me to forgive those who have transgressed against me as I forgive those who have trans, you know, both ways. (laughs) I love to pray Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And you declare that, Lord, you are my shepherd. Lord, I lack no good thing. God, you make me lie down in green pastures. You are agreeing and declaring and asking these scriptures of your life. Psalm 91, we got a big kick out of a house one time. We stopped at a a gas station for a bathroom break on our trip to Odessa. And there was this house that had a sign in front of it. It said, this is Psalm 91 territory. I was like, "Let let them thieves know. Let them know. And I just imagine them thugs walking up to the house trying to rob, like, nope, you got to back up. This is Psalm 91 house. And they went the other way. <laughs> Psalm 91, that's a great one to pray that scripture over yourself. It's a game changer in how you pray when you can pray scripture. You're taking words that are true and in God's word, and you are declaring them over your life. All of us have bought a Hallmark card because we like the words that somebody else wrote in it. <laughs> We don't think anything about it. Also, if you give me a card that has lots of words in it, I'm going to struggle. I'll try. I will read it. But when I buy a card for somebody, it's like, you know, little, a little bit. And then we write our own words, and then we give it to somebody. When we learn to pray scripture, we're taking words that have been given, and we, we speak them from our own heart to the Lord. Number four, suggest you to use a devotional or a book of prayers. As you get your prayer legs under you. There is nothing wrong with taking the prayers that someone else has written and sincerely pray them from your own heart. I was gathering all the devotionals over the last few years that have really been impactful for me in this. And one of them is uh, the Emotionally Healthy Day by Day. It's like 40 days of prayers. And it begins and ends the moment with silence. Like begin this moment with God with silence. And then it walks through through some scripture, a devotional, a prayer, and then ending in silence. And I think that's a really powerful model to follow. So using a devotional or a book of prayers. Number five, like another tool in your tool belt, is worship. These people cannot go home with you. They go to their own homes. And when they are up here leading us in worship, it is not a performance they are leading us in songs that we, in, in, they are leading us in words that we give back to God. And when somebody is leading, like Pastor Landon came up and he led us in a moment of worship, he's guiding us, leading us, showing us how we can take our own words and give them back to God in prayer. And so you can turn on some worship jams in your car and you can sing those back to the Lord. I saw a lady the other day, I was like, she's, she's with the Lord right now. I was like, I know that's not Beyonce or somebody else. I know that this woman is in her prayer closet right now. She was just like, you know, singing that song to the Lord. But even if you like just listen to stuff, go for a walk, but you in in your heart with your own words, you can sing those prayers to the Lord. And that is a powerful form of prayer as well. And the last one is journaling. This has probably had one of the most significant impacts on my own prayer life is just waking up going to my journal, starting it off with some gratitude. Lord, thank you that I can be in your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you meet me in this place. And then just see where it goes. You will be amazed at what can come out of the end of a pen when you sit with the Lord. Sit with silence, centering yourself, and then asking him to speak to you through that. But journaling has been hugely impactful in my own personal prayer life. So when you pray, be honest, because God cannot respond to a fake version of yourself. He cannot heal who you pretend to be. He is not impressed. It doesn't impress God. If you want to impress God, actually, just be honest. Be honest about what's difficult. Be honest about what's hard. Be honest. Be consistent. If you miss a day, don't miss two. If you miss two, don't miss three. But be honest, be consistent, and be succinct. Be succinct. I mean, some of you have a gift of prayer, and you can do it for hours and hours. Bless you. Bless you. 
for the rest of us, you can be succinct. And it's not that we're showing up, rattling off some things for the Lord, and then we're, on, like, we're, we're entering into a loving union with the Father. But you can also be succinct in that. It was Jesus' example to us. So what if tomorrow morning you woke up, you had time with Jesus, and you knew exactly what and how you were going to pray? Would that feel freeing to you? Like you woke up and you weren't just like, like you know what, I'm going to pray through the ACTS acronym today. I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the personal declarations. Or I'm going to pray through Psalm 91 today. Why would this lady put it on a sign outside of her house? Let's find out. God, today I'm going to pray Psalm 91. And maybe you do that for a whole week. Maybe you do it for a month. Maybe you, but the, the point is that you are answering what is your plan for that. You want to have a vibrant prayer life? What is your plan for that? So me sharing those six things, it's really to help give you an answer to the question of what is your plan for that. So you could take any of these and know exactly how and what you are going to pray tomorrow morning. So it can be quick. You can begin your time with Jesus journaling. Um, You can have a personal check-in. You can spend five minutes in prayer. And then your prayer life is like, it's on a whole new level. Because you know where you are and you know where you're going and you know what's coming next. And you know what the destination is. That might be 98% better than your prayer life was last week. And I think that that's a positive thing. And I think you should be proud of yourself for that. Because the reality is that many of us have spent a lifetime, instead of praying, we've spent a lifetime ruminating over these things. Because we really have two options in life. We either give these burdens to God or we ruminate about them ourselves. But God's plan for us in prayer is that he actually gifted us with prayer. He gave prayer to us as a gift so that we can transfer burdens to him to carry because we were never designed to carry all of these burdens. And the thing is that we don't just have burdens for ourselves, is that we also have burdens for our loved ones. And then now, because of the internet, we have burdens for everything. Because we know everything all the time everywhere. I have burdens for politicians. I have burdens for the educational system. I have burdens for... All these countries, are, like we carry these burdens. We're, we're, we're so aware of it. We're just burdened. So our options, the gift of prayer that God has given us is he's saying, come to me. Bring these burdens to me in prayer. I desire to carry these for you. And our prayer partners will be down here in a moment. And it's this transference of burdens where we can say, God, I'm not designed to carry these. I don't want to worry about it. I don't want to obsess over it. God, I want to give these to you. And the thing about ruminating, which is the over and over thoughts in our brains, is we create this pathway in our brain neurologically. And when we have done that for decades, that's the way that our brain knows to go. So as you're learning a new pathway for yourself, be kind to you. Speak to you like you would speak to a friend because you're learning something new. The goal is not perfection. The goal is growth. So if it gets off track, come back. The goal is not perfection. The goal is growth. So here's kind of how it looks like. You practice your faith. You evaluate. Did that work? Did it not work? What was good? What was not good? And then you adjust. You pivot. You make changes. And then you practice again practicing our faith. We accept practice in every facet of life, but we expect prayer to be intuitive. And the reality is that it's not. Prayer is not this intuitive thing that you're born knowing. We have to be taught how to pray. And as you are taught, as you are learning, you are practicing. You're learning brand new ways of doing stuff. So be kind to you. Know that you're growing. It's not perfection. It's it's growth. And you just continue to practice. Philippians 4, 6 tells us not to be anxious about anything. It says, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So we have this moment of, instead of worrying as a Christian, we have an alternative. We have an alternative to self-destruct and self-medicate and all those other things. That's the alternative. But God in his kindness and his love for us has given us the gift of prayer. And it's a, it's a, a meeting with Jesus. We're, we have the opportunity for Jesus to help us carry our burdens. And the Bible even says in, the, in Galatians to carry one another's burdens. So when we have prayer partners down here, it's, it's not just because whatever. It's like, no, we need to carry one another's burdens. As Christians, when you come down, we're going to have a moment in our response time where we can bring our burdens. 
And maybe even as I'm sharing a little bit about burdens, you're aware of the things that are burdening you. And the invitation today is that transference in the relationship. We surrender ourselves to God. We're constantly surrendering, 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 giving our hearts to Jesus and offloading those things to him and trusting that he is going to care for us. Because prayer in and of itself is an act of faith. If you are praying, there's, a, there's, a, there's an element of faith that you have that God is hearing you, that he cares, and that he will respond. So I want to encourage you that even when you pray, that in and of itself is an act of faith. But when you have the boldness to bring that and you want to confess it to another person who can help you carry that burden, you are growing in your faith. You're letting someone else help carry a burden for you. We're not, we weren't designed, created to sustain carrying our burdens. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Prayer is a gift to us in a loving relationship with a loving God to communicate to him, to give him our burdens. So the thing that you are facing, that you need God's answer to, the thing that you don't want to worry about anymore, you want to put it in God's hands because you know that he loves you, you know that he cares for you, and you know that he's going to respond to your prayer. That's the invitation for our transfer today when our prayer partners come down. And as I was preparing for this message, I kept thinking of an old song. And if, if you grew up in church, maybe even an old school church, you may be familiar with this song. It's called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So when we bring our burdens to Jesus, we're bringing them to a man who lived a fully human and perfect life. He experienced all of the temptation that you and I experience. He experienced betrayal and heartbreak frustration and sadness. In other words, this is a judgment-free zone when you meet with Jesus to transfer your burdens. He is ready as a friend to take those things from you. That is part of what prayer is. I wanted to share the lyrics with you to the song because I think that they are so beautiful. And it really highlights the kinds of burdens that we tend to carry that we're not designed to carry. And we have an alternative through prayer to transfer those things. The song says, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. What needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. It's needless grief, needless pain. We forfeit the peace that comes from Jesus when we don't transfer our burdens to him. So there's gonna be an opportunity at the end of service today to just come down for prayer, to just bring him those burdens, to say, God, I I don't wanna forfeit the peace because I'm gonna carry these myself. God, I bring them to you and instead I take your peace. Everything that you need is found in the person of Jesus. If it's peace, if it's joy, if it's forgiveness, if it's an answer, if it's wisdom, if it's guidance, you will find it in the person of Jesus when you bring him your burdens. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. If you're struggling with feelings of discouragement, I would ask, how is your prayer life? And not to shame you or condemn you, but to encourage you to bring those to the Lord and exchange it and let him fill you with his courage, encouragement. If you're discouraged, what is your prayer life like? Can you bring these burdens to him? He says, can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows bear? He bore it all on the cross. That's the beauty of the crosses. Yes, he makes a way for us to God and he bears all of our sorrows, all of the physical healing we need, all of the relational, emotional healing we need. He has bore it all. It says, who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Because if he already knows, he's looking like, will you bring those things to me? Like, I know that you're struggling with these things. I know how you're feeling. I know what's weighing on you. Come to me. 
come bring them to me and I will give you the peace that you need. So if you would just stand and as we start our response time, I wanna encourage you to take a step of faith and as you do that, you will grow in your faith. Because prayer in itself is an act of faith, but also you're bringing these down things down to him. You're trusting that he hears you, that he cares for you, and that he has an answer for you. And maybe your first step is like, hey, that sounds great, but I don't really know God. Well, today is an opportunity for you to know him. Our prayer team is ready to pray this, the prayer of salvation with you, where you accept God as your Lord and Savior. And you take that first step in walking a life with Jesus. You're tired of being in control of your own life and you can allow Jesus to take control and you can follow him. Our prayer team is ready to pray that with you today. The thing that's been weighing on you, the thing that keeps you up at night, the thing that you think about a lot, God is inviting you to transfer that and to exchange that for prayer. Instead of worrying about it, pray about it. Pray about everything. Nothing is too big, nothing is too small. So today I wanted to start talking about it's a loving father you're praying to. Here are some practical tools you can do tomorrow. And then prayer is this loving union with the father where you can bring him your burdens. And that's going to be the moment we enter now. If our prayer partners could go ahead and come on down. We also have communion, which is a, a, a routine thing we do every week that we can look forward to, right? Where we're, we're approaching God with gratitude for his body that was broken for us. Gratitude for his blood that was shed for us so that we can have this moment with him gratitude for the price that was paid so we can be made right before God. So we invite you to take communion, pray with somebody, but whatever you do, do something to respond to the word of the Lord today. Don't leave here without responding. If there's something burdening you, come. If God is calling you to salvation today, come. If something weighing on you, come. He is here and he's, he's waiting for you today to just be in that exchange with him as a loving father. If you would just lift your hands as a sign of surrender to him, Lord, we, we love you. God, we're grateful for you. God, thank you that there's a friend in Jesus where we can bring all our, our griefs to share. And Lord, today, for the things that are weighing on the hearts of, of the people here today, God, would they, would they transfer those to you today? God, would they take an extra step of faith and boldness and release those things to you today? God, you have an answer. You hear them. You're with them. You care for them. God, we trust you and we surrender to you. God, would you speak clearly to each person today, just the burdens that need to be transferred to you. And as we pick up your peace, would you be with them today? In Jesus' name, amen. As the band leads through the next song, you guys are welcome to respond.